God before us, God beside us, God behind us, God above us. Be also now between us a bridge through which your truth may move. In the name of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. One of these things is not like the other. Which one is different do you know? Can you tell which thing is not like the others? I'll tell you if it is so. You remember this from Sesame Street, and that song would come on, and you'd see Big Bird sitting there, and then he'd say, one of these things is not like the other. And he'd have all of these different items, or they weren't all different. There was one thing that was different, but he'd have all these items in front of him, and one thing was very clearly not like the other items. And he was teaching children to compare and contrast. They were encouraged to find the different thing and then to take it out so that you were separating what was different from what was similar. And that is a very important thing for children to know in life, to be able to identify things that are similar and things that are different. I had a real life um, experience with one of these things is not like the other. About eight years ago or so, I was the spiritual director at a middle school camp at Camp McDowell, which is the Episcopal camp in North Alabama around Jasper. And I was there for most of the week and then my wife and three kids, and they were much younger at the time, came to spend a few days and join with the campers and have fun at camp, beautiful place. And so I was walking into the dining hall one day and one of the campers said, hey, where is your good looking babysitter and your kids? One of these things is not like the other. Which one is different? Do you know? Well, the kids knew, right? Young, beautiful wife surely can't be with this old guy. It, the compare and contrast can ultimately become an obsession in life because we love to have things that are similar. In many ways, we they feel that something that is different is either bad or shouldn't be with them. So we try to root it out in many ways. And ultimately, this can impact the relationships that we have in our life. We don't know what is good or bad. It's hard to tell. So we can begin questioning the motives of people and of groups. Why did they do that? Why are they like that? There must be some ulterior motive going on here. And we can spend a great deal of time in life guarding the door and guarding the field, our field, of life from what we consider to be different or bad, that we forget to tend the field for what is good. We forget to plant seed. We forget to nurture that field. And so at the end of the day, we've kept out everything that we consider to be bad or different, but there's nothing good left either, just a barren field. And it can ultimately lead to despair in our lives because there is always a certain amount of good and bad in each and every one of us. One of these things is exactly like all of the others and that can fill us with fear. Our gospel lesson today is the parable of the wheat and the weeds. It is a story that Jesus tells the disciples about a man who goes out into his field and he sows good seed. He is trying to grow a crop of wheat for his sustenance, the sustenance of his family and community, to sell a crop, to make a living. And in the night, an enemy comes and sows in bad seed. And in the ancient world, there was a type of seed that looked just like wheat as it was growing. It was called darnel or sasania. And you didn't know that it was bad wheat, false wheat, until the very end of the crop cycle. And there was no um, grain head on it. There was no fruit from the crop. But you couldn't tell which one was which growing, so you couldn't really root it out. You had to just let them grow together. And the bad thing about the darnel is that it could choke off the good wheat and leave nothing at all. And so the disciples asked Jesus for an explanation of this parable. And he said that the sower was Jesus that the good seed were the people of God and the field was the world and the bad seed were the ones of the evil one. And Jesus goes on to say to the disciples to let them grow together 
that God will sort it out. Because I think that Jesus knew that human nature is to spend so much time worrying about the bad and worrying about what is different that we don't tend to the good, that there is no fruit to the crop of our own life when we do that. John Claypool, and you're going to hear me quote this quite a bit, always says about the parables, or always said about the parables, that it was Jesus using love to cast out fear. And so that if you put that down on top of every parable, then you are looking for the fear in people's lives that Jesus is trying to cast out with love. And in the ancient world, a great deal of time was spent on comparison and contrast. We see that in the work of many of the Pharisees, wondering who is doing what. Are you doing enough? Are you following every jot and tittle of the law just right? And if you're not, then it's my job to point that out and to debate that with you and then to talk about what your punishment will be and what fits your bad works or your different works in this life. And so they spent so much time looking to their left and to their right and over their shoulder that many of them forgot to focus on the good seed of God in their lives and in the world for being and bringing about the kingdom of God in the world. You spend so much time protecting your field that you wake up one day and you realize you haven't planted anything, that it's barren and empty. And we can get caught up in thinking that the, our good works somehow are the seed that God has planted. And then we can begin to separate ourselves slowly from the world until we then become so focused on what's out there that we don't focus on what's in here and what we're doing to make the kingdom of God known through our worship, through our praise, through our living. And we can also get caught up in looking at the bad seed in our own lives because all of us have a certain amount of good and a certain amount of bad in our lives. As Paul says, sometimes I do the things I don't want to do. And so we become so focused on that that we have to point the finger at others to make ourselves somehow look better because we fear that. And then we begin to spend so much time looking out there that again, our field is barren. And there are times where we are led to believe by the world that what is different or that a particular seed that we're nurturing in our lives is somehow other than good. And so they can shame us into doing nothing or into silencing us in some way. And so we then join them in looking out there that we don't nurture what is in here, what God has planted love and justice and mercy. I think about John Lewis, may he rest in peace, who died a few days ago, the African-American congressman from Georgia, civil rights icon from right outside of Troy, Alabama. He didn't listen to the world. He nurtured his field. He nurtured the seed in his life and in the entire world. And he came into contact with bad seed, but in many ways he changed it through the power of God into what is good. He didn't get discouraged. He kept nurturing, kept tending to the crop that was his life. And he made real change. He said this, do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get into good trouble, necessary trouble. There's a story about Larry Doby. He's the first African-American baseball player in the American League played for the Cleveland Indians back in 1947. He was reputed to be a good player, an excellent hitter, and he came at, to bat in his first game, and the crowds were waiting. There was a silence and a hush that came over everyone, and you can tell, or you know, that there were some in that crowd that were against him, that didn't want him to succeed, to prove that somehow he was different from the others. One of these things is not like the others. 
and his first at bat was a disaster. He swung at the first three pitches and missed every one of them by at least a foot. The crowd began to boo him and Larry Doby stared at the ground as he walked back to the dugout. He went to the end of the bench and he put his head in his hands. And the next batter was second baseman Joe Gordon, an all-star hitter who had particular luck against this particular pitcher. So everyone knew that now we prove, right, that one of these things was not like the other. Joe Gordon was going to knock it out of the park and another hush came over the crowd. And he stepped up to the plate and he swung at the first three pitches and missed every one of them by at least a foot. Joe Gordon stared at the ground as he walked back to the dugout. He went to the end of the bench. He sat down next to Larry Doby and put his head in his hands. Even today, people wonder, did he strike out on purpose? Of course, nobody knows for sure except for Joe Gordon. But I can tell you this, it is reported that from that day on, Larry Doby never went on the baseball field but that he did not reach down and pick up the glove of his teammate, Joe Gordon, and hand it to him. What manner of love is this? Even if this act on the part of Joe Gordon meant what we think that it did, it did not cure the problem of prejudice in the stadium that day, but it did represent everything that one person could do at that time and place and under that circumstance to show that we are all God's children, that there is good and there is bad, there is success and there is failure in every single one of us. And as we work together to nurture the field of God, the good seed will grow in all of us and in the world. A darnell can't change a stalk of wheat, but the field can be overcome with the good. And God is the one who gives the growth. One of these things is not like the others. Well, that is ultimately up to God to determine. But what we do know is that God has given us this incredible gift of grace. He's called us his children and welcomed us into the kingdom. He has planted us weeds and all in this field. And there are weeds out there and there are weeds in here. But as we focus and work on grace in ourselves and in each other, we change and God allows us to grow. We can, you fill in the blank, we can with God's help. Amen.